Hey everyone, welcome to Behind the Couch, now streaming from elsewhere, and hopefully you're catching us on YouTube, best way to do it. Uh, but we will continue to have this audio feed on the Behind the Couch feed on our Patreon stream, and then the video is, yes, live on YouTube right now, and we can keep that one, but we like to put our little intro on it, so we'll probably end up making it pretty and re-putting it up there at some point. Uh, so I'm Dr. Shiloh here with Dr. Scott from LA Not So Confidential. How's everyone doing? Scott's going to be our, our monitor for YouTube. So uh, go ahead and put your questions in there. We are also, we know it is streaming on Instagram right now. I'll try to keep an eye on that. Um, but we just, we're multitasking. We're trying to figure it out is what we're doing. <laughs> but it looks like it's working really well because we've got a lot of interaction going on over here in the live chat. And the way the live chat works is it's combining chat from all the platforms, I believe, and sort of routing them. Um, on Lula, here? if you're on the Lula website. It oh, is. if you're on Lula. Okay. Yes. I did want to say Ava. Hey, Ava. She's doing her homework for her sexual deviance course while watching this. So she's oh. got her priorities straight. Yes. Yes, Absolutely. you do have your priorities straight. Thank you. <laughs> oh, living vicariously through you. I miss that stuff. <laughs> I oh, wow. Up. There's a lot of there's a lot of homework being done. And yes. Yeah. Yes, Abby. I, I did a, an acid peel. I did a home acid peel. So my skin is very glowy today. She nice. gave me a compliment on my skin. <laughs> I mean, what, what would our live streams be without our estheticians corner? <laughs> I know, seriously. Like we should just broadcast while we're getting an extraction facial one day. Oh, dude, my esthetician would be down for that. I saw her today. I had to go pick up some product and she <laughs> asked me the other day, Hey, do you want to be my model? I'm going to the school to learn this new thing. And I need a person to like, come down and practice on. She's like, I know you'd be down for it. And I was like, well, one, it'll be free. Um, but I'd have to take a day off work. So it doesn't really work out. <laughs> She's like, oh, okay, but we'll try it on you next. So oh, I did that one time in the eighties and got like the shittiest frost job. Oh like, God, oh, in a cosmetology awful. school. It was awful. Yeah. I had like a friend's like, oh no, it'll be really great. And then I, my hair was just fried. I had to go like to a, like a, a buzz cut for six weeks to grow the shit out. Nice, nice. All spiky and frosty in the eighties. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Like little narrow sunglasses. Yeah. <laughs> but everybody welcome back. I, again, I know that I say this every single time, but oh my gosh, we have even more Patreon members. It's so exciting. Um, and, and we also did something that we should have been doing from the beginning as like most Patreon feeds do is um, now that we have regular advertisers on our show. Um, if you're a Patreon member, you get a, an exclusive ad free version of our show. Yes. Um, so check that out as well as some other swag. And we want to welcome our new Patreon members, uh, Lauren, Lucinda, Elizabeth A, Leah H, Kathleen C, Hadriana, Bethany, Jennifer R, Mark B, Shelby T, Delaney P, Jackie R, Jennifer M, Alexis F, Robin, Lacey, Jennifer, and Sophia F. That was Jennifer S as opposed to Jennifer R. We want right. to make sure we get both of those in. <laughs> and Jennifer M. <laughs> and Jennifer M. Thank you guys so much. Y'all are just like bursting yeah. my cold little Southern heart. I'm telling Aww, you. Yeah, you guys are killing it. We've had a lot of folks sign up lately and thank you so much. Um, tell us what you want. Tell us what you need as Patreon members, what you'd like to see. And we'll try to do the best we can. Um, you know, when you leave Patreon, we get to see why people leave. And I can tell you overwhelming majority is not complaining about what they're getting or not getting. It's just their financial situation has changed, which we totally understand. And then we have people come back when they can again. And it's just whatever you guys, you know, we're just, again, so grateful to have the folks here that we have. And we, we try to figure out ways that we can make time to do things for you. So yes, we will be starting with episode 100 on up to get the um, ad-free episodes up there. And then we'll start working backwards when we have the time to, because <laughs> some of those we need to stitch together. Some of them um, we need to put music on. 
maybe Scott has all those somewhere in a beautiful cache that he can just dump and I can get them in there, but we'll figure it out. But we'll definitely start with episode 100 moving forward. So you guys have all that. Um, what else? Anything at the top? We'll be in Dallas next week, this time next week for True Crime Podcast Festival. Um, so excited to be back, to see friends, to do our presentation, which is looking amazing. We are doing a case study on the Sherry Papini case with Amy and Megan from Women in Crime. So you'll have four doctors on a panel picking apart this really, really unique situation. Um, it's interesting in doing the research for that. I actually found a vintage case of somebody that was semi-famous here in LA back in the 30s yep. that faked yep. her own sort of kidnapping. So stay tuned for that probably in our future. <laughs> so, and we've also, you know, we're getting back in the groove of our live feeds um, or our live streams um, as opposed to twice a month, we're doing once a month, but that's because we've additional, we've added additional content you right. now have weekly content that includes an, an ongoing vintage series and ongoing cover ongoing coverage of a documentary and those documentaries that we're reviewing and commenting on have all been suggested by you our listeners and there are some great ideas so yeah. we've already um recorded several of those and they'll be coming out on our regular schedule yeah um you know there's so many documentaries it's like we get a ton of um, recommendations and we're only doing one a month. It's kind of, I wish we would be able to do more. Uh, and I know there's other podcasts that that's just their thing and that's what they do. So they can keep up with whatever the documentary of the month or the week is. Um, but yeah, we're, we're like we said, we're gonna kind of toggle back and forth to what is um, sort of hot and trendy if we can time it right, as well as maybe going back and looking at some of those more foundational ones. I um, think we're probably coming up on doing some that are multi-episode finally. So maybe you and I could be watching some stuff on the plane on the way to and from Dallas to get ready for our next ones. Absolutely, you gotta love that Netflix <laughs> download feature. <laughs> All right, so I am going to admit our guest, Dr. John Gelatori, while I go ahead and introduce you guys to him. This is his second time with us. Um, if you remember, Dr. John Delatore is a fellow forensic psychologist working in many of the areas that Scott and I have both worked in. Uh, this man has just a ton of experience. We were so like smitten with his brain last time he was here we had to have him back <laughs> um he's licensed in arizona texas new york you've probably al also seen him as he has done a lot of commentary i feel like it's almost every day i see a tweet that john's gonna be on court tv or law and crime trial network speaking on such a wide variety of forensic psych topics um Talk about having like your finger on the pulse. You really get to talk about this stuff in real time. Here we have to record stuff ahead of time, but you're like doing it on the daily, it feels like. <laughs> well, I don't know about on the daily, but certainly <laughs> more often than I think I, I had anticipated that I would be doing. Uh, and it's certainly an interesting aspect to the work that we do because there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of experts that go onto all of these trials and it's certainly helpful to understand to break down what the expert is testifying to, to an audience, yeah, right? To, to figure out what exactly it is that they found and whether or not that uh, stands up to the scientific rigor that it should. Because most most often it doesn't. I have a lot of problems with some of the experts that uh, <laughs> testify. Don't, <laughs> you sometimes, don't you sometimes want to go experts in air uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, there, there have been times when I've rolled my eyes on air to some, oh. some of the stuff that, that has been said, so yeah. Did you, um, cause I know, I don't know what it was like for you guys, but going through grad school, I remember being heavily warned against, and this was probably just the bias of my teaching staff about being a quote unquote talking head. And so I think for me, that really had me tread lightly of like, is this something I want to do? What sort of projects would I pick? John, was that? on your radar? I mean, and tell us how you kind of fell into it if it wasn't. 
Uh, so how I fell into it was that I have uh, a journalism background from college. So oh, no uh, I was managing editor of the student newspaper. So I, I, I had already had some journalism background. I had uh, some, some awards for television news anchoring, stuff like that. So I had already had that experience and I didn't like I didn't want to lose it. But as I got further and further into grad school, like I got further and further away from journalism. Mm. Uh, I ended up coming back to it a little bit when it comes to my writing style and I make sure that I incorporate alternative uh, ideas, alternative hypotheses, make sure that I look at whatever I'm doing from multiple lenses. Uh, so that's in, so, the, so some of the writing is included in, in my reports, but uh, Law and Crime was still a brand new network, but not brand, brand new, but they, they were still looking for some people. Um, to kind of fill in for, for some of the commentary that they were doing. And I had said, you know, you guys have live trials and you guys have experts that are on there. Wouldn't it be beneficial if you had an expert yourself to talk about whether or not that that's up to snuff? So you approached uh, them? I approached them, yeah. So, nice. and, and they said yes, you know, and really that's kind of been sort of the thing that I've been doing pretty much my entire career, which is I may be prepared for it. I may not be, but I'm never going to know until after I've done the thing. So I sure. usually just ask, you know, all they can do is say no or not answer. And if they say yes, then I got to figure out how I'm going to do it. So <laughs> definitely, is, I, but I've never, I, I never, uh, in, in our program, I don't think it was ever on their radar that someone would be a talking head. And so yeah, it like it was never it was never approached to us. But there's always it whatever ethics class you take, they always say that you're gonna do something wrong. And the problem is is that they don't know how to read the ethics, right? They don't they don't like, exactly. no, thank yeah, you. It, it, yeah. So I mean it's it's not as hard as people like to think it is, and you're not gonna get in trouble right. uh, as often as you as they say that you're gonna get in trouble. So That's I just a great way I, to put it. I do what I do and if someone has a problem, well I'm, I'll ask them where in statute does it say that I can't do this? You so, know, yeah. I I think that's Shiloh had such a good question and it makes me think about sort of a timeline. I mean, I'm an older adult, but I'm a, you know, I'm a mid-career psychologist because this is my third career. I went to school late and I heard some of that stuff. I was warned in my forensics classes and expert testimony classes like, yeah, I mean, this, this is a very necessary thing to do. We need people to do this, but be prepared, know what it means. Mm -hmm. But I don't, but that was also over 15 years ago. And I don't think anybody back then had any idea about how sure. media was going to evolve. I don't, I mean, I certainly would not have been able to predict it. And I know my professors weren't able to. So I think that maybe we kind of tend to look through that lens that was forced on us you know, two decades ago that just doesn't fit in today's world because there's a need for this now. There's actually a real need for commentary on framing something within appropriateness and morality and ethics. Or else you're stuck with these TikTokers who are like uh, like doing all this strange content and stuff like that. And so I, I liken what I do and probably what you guys do too is this is the teaching part of what we do. Right. This this is us doing that aspect of of our work, which includes teaching and includes, you know, making sure that other people understand what exactly it is that's going on and and all that other stuff, because you, you definitely don't want to be, you know, beholden to the TikTokers of the world, you know, oh my God, there's and everything. Yeah. There are some right now. There's one that's saying it's a psychological fact. If someone looks up to their right while you're talking to them, they're in love with you. Like, what? Where did you I, even come up with I, I, this? Dr. Scott, you, you, you're you going to get me on a rant here. <laughs> Go for it. Cor, cause we Cor love TV, rants. Because Court TV has done this thing a couple of times, not often. In the evening programming that, that I've been a part of, they have someone on there that is a body language expert. Mm. And the book is, the, the book that this person wrote is called You Can't Lie to Me. And it's, I... I I have to roll my eyes every time I listen to this. And when I get asked, you know, when I'm on air and they ask me, you know, well, this person is doing this thing, Dr. Delatore, you know, what does the body language would say? I say, I always answer with, we have to really be cautious when we're answering a question about body language. I don't know this person, so I can't tell you. The science behind body language is absolute trash. There, There is nothing to suggest that any of the body language experts actually know what they're talking about. 
And this one person in particular, it was during the Amber Heard trial and was mm -hmm. saying all of this awful stuff about Amber Heard, about what her behaviors, right? What her body language was saying that she was doing. And I have like an actual, in my mind, I'm thinking about all the actual real world reasons why she would be engaging in those behaviors sure. that have nothing to do with character or logical issues or mental health issues, right? Or personnel, like, like it has nothing to do with this. Like, because she held her head up like this, that she's a snob. Well, she wears a hair piece, right? She wears a, like a big thing of hair. So that's gonna get heavy. Like yeah. that's why her head's up because she's wearing <laughs> a giant fake hair wig. It's just logistical people. It's, it's, it's just- <laughs> Well, it's also it's, cultural. I mean, you know, there's- yeah to make these broad generalizations about people. I mean, there are so many cultures just within the geographic US that have very, yeah. very different standards for how you present yourself effectually and how you sit. You know, I grew yeah. up in the deep South and every every girl of my generation and before was taught sort of the beauty queen way to sit. Like this is mm -hmm. the only yeah. way you sit and you don't move. Yeah. So how could you read into that? There's, the, yeah, I. And there's several other copycat body language experts. I mean, how do they, how do they get that title? Like, how did you become an expert? There's no courses for that. Yeah, one of them is like, well, I've been in like the DEA for 20 years or something like. So they'll lean on law enforcement experience and stuff like that. And it, it, they're clearly using right inappropriate techniques that they learned as part of like the interrogation process as they right. developed uh, their law enforcement skills. But it's it, it's like i don't want our audience to think that body language like you can't do it what's true is that if the longer you get to learn someone right the longer you know someone the more that you can kind of see how their body moves and why they do the things that they do but that takes time yeah like even in our therapy clients like it takes us a little while of understanding who they are before we can understand what their body's doing but a cold read or something like that, right? That's all the, that's flim flam man, right? That That's a huckster, right? That's, that's PT Barnum kind of stuff. That's, that's not, that's, that's not legitimate. That's yeah, not. it is. It, we, Scott and I were just having a conversation with someone last night about what an expert is. And, you know, we broke down, you know, a, a plumber can be an expert in a court of law. He has a specific set of skills and experience and training that the average population doesn't have. So he can be voir dire and testify to that. But then when you talk about these professionals that are quote unquote experts, like you're giving the example of a DEA agent, perhaps saying he's an expert in body language reading or lying, truth telling, whatever, that has, that has nothing to do with the thing that they're asking him to be an expert on. Yeah, you're, you're probably an expert on perhaps speaking with criminals doing investigations perhaps, but it's just based on training. To me, I always go, okay, training's super important, but where's the research and the evidence-based data to back up what yeah. you're even saying? Yeah, but it makes good for, it makes for good TV Heck having yeah. someone like this. And, <laughs> and sometimes that's what, that's what it's about, right? It's, a, it's about that advertising sales and having good TV. So it's, it's, a, it's an important balance, right? To have someone that is definitely more dramatic and brings a sense of, you know, the theatric theatricality mm -hmm. to, to what we're doing, but also then having someone that's a little bit more grounded and, and sort of, well, let's take a different approach, right? Let's look at what yeah. these individuals are doing through a different lens and making sure that it's balanced, but. For sure. And, and I think, again, this was something Scott and I were also having a conversation about last night was, you know, I might have that voice of my professor in my head who, okay, yeah, that was 15 years ago, but when did they get trained? How long ago was that, right? So all this doom and gloom um, is something they passed on to me, but Scott and I and you, it seems, have really thoughtfully looked at when we do different projects and put our names out there and attach it and our voices and our faces. We're very thoughtful about that, but our professionalism is something that can't be tainted, even if it's like, the worst production in the world we are who we are and we're going to present right. that way i know there's editing that can be done to do yeah, terrible yeah. things to people yeah. but um i feel like you hit that sweet spot of um and it makes sense now that you have that journalism background that you've told us about because you know you're informative you're professional but you're also entertaining to watch and if i get an eye roll from a, a forensic psychologist when it's warranted i'm gonna love that <laughs> yeah <laughs> i'd be like okay that's real like good yeah. 
good. Yeah. Um, so you're also finishing up another degree overachiever. I am. Can you I tell am. us about yes, that? Yes, I am. So to preface all of this, I am in fact in law school, right? I am, but I'm not getting a JD. Okay. I'm getting a, I'm getting a master's in jurisprudence. And the reason why I'm getting this degree is because I say that I'm a forensic psychologist and I say that I'm supposed to be able to apply psychological concepts to the law. I don't have any real training in the law at mm. all. Like throughout graduate school, we had uh, this forensic professor who would tell us about what the law says, but I never actually went back and read the cases. I never went back and actually did any of those things because that's not what I was trained to do. Sure. And so now that I have my own practice um, and attorneys are contacting me directly about you know doing the work, what I recognize is that they speak a completely different language. Mm. Like it, the law is so totally different. And there are things that they want me to do that, number one, I don't understand where that's even coming from. And number two, I think a lot is getting lost in translation. And so for me, it was incumbent upon me to say, they're not going to learn my language, right? They're not going to learn what it is that I learned. I spent a long time learning what I learned. Yeah. And so I found this program that's here in San Antonio, the law school here that offered a master's degree in jurisprudence. So I don't have to take like property or contracts classes. Like I don't have to take all of the other basic classes that a, a lawyer needs to take. I specifically chose a criminal justice concentration. So I only took criminal law classes, procedure classes, constitutional law classes. Like I'm only taking classes that are specifically devoted to how I can uh, boost my legal language, my legal legalese. Yeah, yeah. So when I talk about these kinds of things, I can bridge the gap. And you see that a lot in my, in the media commentary that I do, that I can bridge that gap between what an expert is thinking about psychologically versus what a, a lawyer is thinking about versus what a judge or a jury they're supposed to be thinking about as it applies to the law. Mm. So I, I, I felt that uh, necessary for me, and I don't think it's necessary for every forensic psychologist. I just thought it was important for me to be able to learn to speak this other language and do so in a way that lawyers would feel comfortable saying, oh, well, you know, he went to law school, he gets it, right? I may totally. not be a lawyer, but, you know, I went to the same program that a lot of these other lawyers went to. So they get it, right? That they, they feel more comfortable. And it's a good networking thing. So they just feel more comfortable being that's able to awesome. talk to them. How, uh, that's commendable for sure. And you found another way to go back to school, which is what I would love to do, but I don't have the time or the money to do that. <laughs> but how cool is that? Very, very good. That's gonna, just to have that concentration where you don't have to deal with all the other BS of law yeah. school. Um, yeah. How great. Very, very cool. Um, well, I thought Scott could give us a little recap on the Amber Heard, Johnny Depp trial before we get into some of these things we're going to talk about today. Just if people did not watch or if they need reminding, because it's been a little bit, um, then we can jump into our sort of psych topics having to do with this. Scott? So, yeah, I want to give some bullet points. Um, first, we want to just, I mean, if I'm sure anyone listening or watching today is not unaware of both Johnny Depp and Amber Heard. Johnny Depp has had a long, very significant career in Hollywood. He was basically a child actor, very, very gifted, regardless of what you think about him or what he his behaviors are, both positive and negative. He is a very talented performer and also developed a reputation for being a brat on set very, very early. Um, his career derailed and went right into movies from 21 Jump Street when he just got tired of the work schedule. And he was the star of the show, um, kind of took his own path and really kind of just went from one success to the other. He's really only had several, just a handful of flops. Amber Heard is younger. Um, she herself is also a very talented actor. Um, she, she has not had necessarily the large uh, roles that Mr. Depp has had, although her career was moving along, especially with her being part of the uh, DC universe as Mira, um, and a superhero herself or an 
Atlantean um, uh, resident with a lot of superpowers. So anyway, uh, let's talk about just the basics of the trial. So between April 11th, 2022 and June 1st, 2022, Johnny Depp and Amber Heard engage in a trial with Depp as plaintiff against defendant Amber Heard. Depp alleged that Heard had engaged in activities that resulted in defamation, leading him to file a claim of $50 million in damages. Heard, in response, countersued, claiming $100 million in damages. Depp and Heard were married from February 2015 to May 2016 after a long relationship when they met in 2009. Early in their divorce proceedings, Heard alleged that Depp had abused her physically, leading to Depp suing the UK news group newspapers. Depp lost that suit, and it's significant to say here that the way things are tried and def defined as defamation in the UK are actually quite different than they are in the US. And that is a very significant point here in these proceedings. In this most recent trial, Depp claimed that a December 2019 op-ed or opinion editorial by Amber Heard implicated him without naming him as that unnamed perpetrator of sexual violence against her person. Depp blamed the op-ed for the damage to his career. So he was doing, there's interesting too, he was having some career problems at that time, but it's an interesting juxtaposition of juxtaposition of events that certainly made it worse. During the span of the trial, Depp's legal team focused on dispro disproving Hurt's allegations, and they gave examples of her history of instigating escalating events of violence. Jurors ruled that Hurd's claims and statement regarding sexual violence and domestic abuse were false and did in fact defame Depp with what is called actual malice. So intentional, actual malice. Depp was awarded 10 million in compensatory damages and $5 million in punitive damages from Hurd. The actual amount tendered, however, was reduced just to the punitive damages to $350,000 due to the limit that is imposed by the state of Virginia where the trial took place. The jury also ruled that Depp's lawyers did actually defame Heard by falsely alleging that she and her friends staged damage to Depp's penthouse as part of a hoax. Heard was then awarded $2 million in compensatory damages and zero in punitive damages from Depp. The jury ruled that Waldman's other allegation, Waldman being Depp's, one of Depp's attorneys, his other allegations against Heard's sexual violence hosts and abuse hosts against Depp had not been proven to be defamatory. So that's, I mean, that's a lot. It's more than just a couple of bullet points, but all of those things are very important in the process of really what could be called like the reality TV trial of the century. I mean, yeah, there's a lot sure. of competition for trial of the century going whenever century you're looking <laughs> at, but this was a big one and really quite a, a, a bellwether for celebrity trials, I think. So I thought maybe we can just start off with as three forensic psychologists, personal or professional reactions to this whole circus of the century. <laughs> maybe this is a good, good, uh, observation here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Scott, you want to start? Just like, what did you think about this when it was going on? So I have a lot of mixed feelings. Um, and I think that they've continued to evolve. As most people who listen to us know, I was in the entertainment industry for a long time, first as a performer and then in talent management, casting, uh, television and film, and then in post-production. So I have, I'm, I'm used to performers living in a different world than the rest of us mere mortals. They mm. really do. Um, even if you're a C-list, middle-class working actor, you really live in a different world. Um, and I've met wonderful, wonderful celebrities that are the most down-to-earth people you've ever met. And I've met others that like are incredibly rude and yet at the same time, incredibly sad. Like the, to me, they radiate, you understand why they're acting this way. It's not acceptable behavior, but you understand it. So I have this understanding that a lot of performers that reach that level, it's almost like politics. You have to have a certain level of narcissism, whether you are narcissistic yourself, you have to have these traits 
that you utilize in order to protect your career. You know, people get very angry, like, I can't believe that Matt Damon didn't stop and talk to me for five minutes in Olive Garden and sign my autograph. It's like, he lives in a different world than you do. That's not possible for him to do this with every single person that they meet. But then that one thing gets put online and it turns into a completely different monster. Now, all of this being said, this is not how we feel about these individuals. I don't particularly like either one of them. I don't find either one of them likable at mm -hmm. all. I do recognize and acknowledge their talent. And I certainly recognize how much money they can make the people that hire them. But what did this comes down to, and this is where I've had arguments with very dear friends of mine that are private practice clinicians at le like the doctoral level, at the master's level, is I keep telling them, stop judging both of these players by your personal feelings about them. And let's look at, this is a trial of defam defamation. This is allegations. And this is about whether or not those allegations have enough evidence to prove that they are true in a court of law. And that's all that this is about. And it got ugly and circus-like. And I think that we all have to look at our internal misogyny, our internalized misogyny, um, our internal judgment, myself included, I have to check myself, but sorry, I'll put my, my box back under the desk <laughs> now, but I think it's complex. I mean, and, and, yeah. you know, I'm a mental health professional with a lot of training and it's complex for me. And I think that it's just easy for people to square off and start pointing fingers. And that's all based on their visceral reaction to these very dramatic personalities. Yeah. Yeah. Well said, John, what about you? Just high level view personally. I'm, I'm going to echo every single thing that Dr. Scott just said. And I said all of that stuff on air, like all, all of it, everything that you talked about. I was about. just copying you. I just like, yeah. I was like reading you. <laughs> <laughs> Including the internalized uh, misogyny. Like there, there were a lot of like hangers on for Johnny Depp that came after who sort of were justifying uh, everything and you could hear what they were saying. And, and I had gone on air and I said that a lot of what I'm hearing is sort of uh, misogynistic. And I got just roasted online for saying, well, you just don't get it. You, you're not paying it. Like you, you clearly don't get it, but I'm going to add a couple of things because I agree 100% with everything from, I don't like either one of the two. I, d I don't think that either one really put on the best case. I think it was all show. Like there were a lot of problems that I had. I had problems with uh, the experts, the so good quote unquote experts that I have problems with every single one that had gone on. Um, I, I, I don't think that they were as infallible as they portrayed themselves out mm -hmm. to be. But the other thing, the real thing that really got to me was that Amber Heard's defense team did not show up to protect her in any way, shape or form. And I get that truth is the absolute defense against defamation. But at every turn, Johnny Depp's team had a trap set up for them. And these two individuals continuously walked into every single, like they could not, and they had like a two week break and they could not change tack at all. Mm -hmm. I think what, I think the real issue that was at play that did not come until the very closing arguments was that this thing was written in an op-ed, an opinion editorial. This needed to be about the First Amendment. Does she have the right to say her opinion about her perception, about her life? And nowhere was any of that evidence presented to the jury, nowhere. Whether we like her or not, whether we believe her or not, is totally and completely irrelevant to this. Does she have a First Amendment right to say what her opinion is, to say what her perception about her life is? And I don't think her defense team came anywhere close to even getting to the jury to say, no, this isn't about, quote unquote, definition, de defamation. This is just the suit that was brought by Johnny Depp. This is about the, your First Amendment right to say your opinion. And nowhere in there did they say, did they present any evidence till, until the very closing argument. And even then there was only a few sentences. And I think that's that's where they missed it. This could not be a, a, a grudge match in the dirt because Amber Heard was going to lose. And I, I, I have pr plenty of reasons why I think she was going to lose. 
but she was going to lose this thing. And this needed to be an argument about the Constitution. And I think that would have gotten Virginia jury to talk about like actual constrict constructionist uh, interpretation of the con of the Constitution would have turned that jury. But their defense team just failed her, just constantly failed. Her. Yeah, that would have been so clean and concrete for them to wrap their heads around. Yeah. What a great defense that would have been. Like, here it is. This is all this is about. The rest of this is dog and pony. Yeah. Let's and, focus and she, on that. And she still may not have won, but at least it would have been cleaner. Yeah. Right? True. Yeah. True. Yeah. yeah. Well, I let you guys go first about your opinions about this case, because I can tell you, I recoiled from it very early on <laughs> um, and really started to uh, tap into more of what was going on online about it and didn't like that either. It just felt so icky that um, I really just kind of tapped out at that point. I watched a few TikTok like hilarious things done by very creative people. Um, and I know people were just glued to their televisions, but I really felt gross watching it and watching the recaps and reading about things that were happening afterwards that I really just, just distanced myself <laughs> from it because I don't know what period of time I was in my life. It was just too much to add to my plate, even for entertainment factor, but but that was just it. That, I guess that is my takeaway, that it felt like, why are we being allowed to watch this? Of course, I know why, but like we're being allowed to watch this and therefore it's an entire performance for the world to cast judgment, um, which just felt, didn't feel like justice for anybody. No, no, I 100% I really? agree with all of that too. Cause it's just, one of the things that really struck out to me, particularly early on with some of Johnny Depp's character witnesses that were there was that they always described him as this Southern gentleman. What? Why, why would a Southern gentleman, and I'm from, I'm not from the deep South, I'm from Texas, right? But so I'm from the South, right? But as a, as a Southern gentleman, I never, like Southern gentlemen don't bring out the dirty laundry in this way against a woman, as, as misogynistic as that might be. Right, uh, uh, you know, uh, whatever that is, this is not something that a Southern gentleman would ever do. And so to, to for other people and him to come out and say that he's this kind of person, there are other ways that you could have handled this, right? In the press, in the media, right? You've been in, you've been in Hollywood for a long amount of time. You've got PR people that you can that you can hire to get you past this, right? Robert Downey Jr., yeah. right? Rob Lowe, like with the list goes on. Uh, even uh, Louis C.K. just won a Grammy, right? So there are all yeah. these people that have weathered this kind of storm before and none of them took it like this. I know Robert Downey Jr., I know he went to trial, but that, I mean, that sure. wasn't nearly as uh, dramatic as this, but it just, it, you're right. It, it just felt, it felt gross. It felt icky. It, it did, it, it felt like, we were being forced to be a voyeur to to these two's uh, yeah. like uh, inappropriate relationship and having to listen to all of this stuff. It just, it just, oh, it was just, yeah. it was just gross, but people ate it up. It did. It was, it, it was very performative from, you know, attorneys and experts and everyone involved. And I thought it kind of did the court an injustice, so to speak. Um, so of course, like, as this is going on and you know you're doing your commentary you and i are kind of messaging back and forth about a few things and you brought up this concept of the black sheep phenom phenomenon um yeah. and i thought it was just so interesting and so spot on for what we were seeing starting to play out uh in you know social media and the layperson's commentary can you define that for us and then yeah. let's just talk about how it applied here yeah, so I think our audience understands the difference between the in-group and the out-group bias. I, you know, for, we tend to paint an out-group, right? People that we are not a part of, groups that we're not a part of. It's just one big, long brushstroke, right? They're all the same personality. They have all the same characters. They have all the same flaws. We just paint all of the out-group as just one just big individual. But our in-group, right, the groups that we do belong to, we can see 
you know, all the positive qualities and negative qualities. We see them as individuals. What I noticed was that even within the in-group that Amber Heard was supposed to be a part of, a, a woman first, domestic violence survivor, number two, right? Sexual assault survivor, number, like there were all these groups that she's supposed to be a part of that you would think would rally to her because she's part of the in-group. That's the whole point of being, of having a group is that they rally to you and they protect you and, you know, they assist you in whatever it is that they need. It's the out group, right? It's the men, right? It's, it's mm -hmm. the individuals who have been found guilty of domestic violence, but continue to claim that they were innocent, right? Like it's all the out group. That's who should be attacking Amber Heard, like th that we should be hearing from the, the men first and right incels, you know, like we should be hearing right. from all of these people about how much they hate Amber Heard. But one thing that I noticed when you go online is all of this sort of real bad, nasty language being directed towards her from the people that are supposed to be in her group. And that's called the black sheep phenomenon. That's when, you know, as a member of the in-group, you notice that someone is not fitting in. They're not participating in the in-group the way that they should be. So then they're ostracized as being the black sheep of the family. Right, so that's why we call it the the, the black sheep phenomenon. So a member of our in group is doing is violating our in group uh, societal norms, and so now they must be pushed out and 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 pushed to the side. That makes me think so much of you know at the master's level and really um, getting trained in family systems when one individual becomes the identified patient. Yeah, like mm. we we're we're a working system. We are a psycho cybernetic organism that relies on each other. But this one is not doing. This is the one that's not doing what we want them to do. And yeah. if that person were to be removed and taken out of the system completely, somebody else is going to fit that role. Yeah, and that's I think what you're describing. It seems very similar to that. Is that the the movement you know the protection of women's rights and bodily autonomy and you know the right to be free of of violence perpetrated upon themselves you know has is such a has so much light on it right now that they you know it's necessary to have the person that represents it in the most holistic and wholesome way and that's just not what she can do part of it is because like we were saying earlier neither one of them is likable I mean, if you want to break it down, like one of the things that they give as a seminal sort of turning point for their relationship was when they, because she was busy, he took his own boots off. And that was yeah. the beginning of the end for them. And she supposedly just goes insane and blah, 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 you know, all these things that he says. And yet what we do is we're all completely happy to ignore. It's like, wait, you guys have been together for years and your your daily routine is to come in and sit down and have her take this submissive role of taking off your boots how effed up is that i mean yeah. you know look in a, in a real relationship outside the bubble of celebrity it's like you know if my husband tried to do that i'd go like um did you empty, empty the what dishwasher is <laughs> are the gar is the garbage in because that's what i'm yeah. more interested in i can take off my fucking shoes go clean out the dishwasher yeah, that's an altered yeah. alternate alternate <laughs> universe that they live in, right? Absolutely. Um, so when there is a black sheep in our in group, um, is it just that they're not going with the herd as a play on words, I guess here sure. <laughs> enough? Or do we know what it is about that black sheep that then causes us to rally against them? And then I guess my second part is, to that is, what do you think it was about Amber that had other survivors shun her? Yeah, so I, it, it's unclear what exactly it is that creates this black sheep other than we recognize they're not fitting in into the culture that we've established as part of our in-group. Um, it, it's, it's hard to say what is what exactly it is that's going to make someone the black sheep. It could be that there is some kind of inaction, right? Maybe they were supposed to do something and then they didn't. And then moving forward that they're not going to be 
well accepted or it could just be that they were supposed to represent something to a society at large and they failed to do so and so now because they failed to do it now we have to shun them in such a way i think there are a lot of things that amber heard that were unfortunate for amber heard uh number one she's not likable Mm. uh number two i think her physical appearance can it can work against you in some ways i, I think some people may be turned off by her attractiveness mm, right? like the, a reverse the, halo effect yeah like a reverse halo effect uh, i think it's what do they call it? the devil's horns or something like that. they yeah. call it something else um and so but the the one thing that i absolutely think turned everyone against her was that she kept embellishing the story mm. and you could f- we're not good at telling uh, when some we're not good at lie detectors, right? We can't tell when someone is lying to us, not right. really, right. but we can absolutely tell when someone is telling us the truth. We're much better at we're, that. Yeah. We're truth detectors. And so what I saw when Amber Heard was giving her testimony was someone who was looking for feedback. Whenever we tell a story, you know, we're all sitting mm-hmm. at the bar or something like that. We're drinking beers. Right. We're starting to tell our, you know, tall tales about how our life's been. We look to others, right, for our story to get feedback, immediate feedback. And if we don't think our story's landing, we're going to embellish just a little bit more. Right. That's just our natural tendency as storytellers. It's just to kind of say, hey, you know, you guys aren't feeling it. So let me just up the ante a little bit. Yeah. And that's I fascinating. Think- that sounds like cold reading, like when you go to a Vegas show and somebody's the mentalist. Yes, and, and the, so the, they keep they keep putting out bits and pieces of information so that somebody latches onto it. Yes, and we're we're we are good at detecting those kinds of things, particularly from those individuals that we want to accept us, right? So if we want to be accepted by this group that maybe we only have a limited uh, participation in, or maybe it's a we have a long-standing participation but we need bigger status than what we have recently. So we start telling these kinds of stories and we start noticing how people are responding to these kinds of stories. And if we're getting good response, then we just continue to tell the story as is. If people are starting to look away, right, that they're focusing on other things, or maybe they're starting to have side conversations, then we have to say something dramatic to draw people back into Mm -hmm. the conversation. And so people were looking at Amber Heard's testimony and what she was saying, and it always seemed like it was one step more. Like every single event that she's describing, she describes, and then she turns to the jury and describes a little bit more. And then the next event occurs, she describes it, she turns to the jury, she gets whatever feedback that they're giving, and then she goes a little bit further. So every single time, every event, it becomes just a little bit more and more embellished that That's had she just stuck had she just stuck with one story just just yeah. one story all you needed is if your case theory is that the absolute truth is defense to defamation just say one story that can absolutely be believable to everyone cuz everyone has had this experience in a relationship just stick to one but it started becoming 12 13 15 20 different incidents that were supposed to be abuse where she's claiming that she's, you know, got the crap beat out of her or something like, and then there's pictures of of it not happening. And so now she has to up the ante, right? Because not only was she the defendant, she was a plaintiff on the countersuit that she said that she filed. So now she's got to go back in for the rebuttal. So I think what was happening was all of these members who were, she's supposed to be an in-group of all these women's groups, feminists, right? Domestic violence survivors, right? Intimate partner violence, sexual assault, like all of these groups that she's supposed to be a part of are looking at her. They're turned off by her because of her attractiveness, right? They don't think, they don't believe her because she's, you know, a beautiful actress, number one. Some people tend to believe that the more attractive you are, the less likely you are to engage and uh, have bad things happen to you. Hmm. And then, uh, and then she goes on the stand and starts saying all of these things and people are like this, but this doesn't sound like the truth. It may not be a lie, but it's certainly not the truth. And so then they just, then they come after you more and more and more. And that's when you are the black sheep. And that's when the entire social media community has completely turned. Well, not everybody. There's obviously, you know, some people who believe, I believe Amber Heard was a pretty uh, trending yeah. 
hashtag, but a lot of people just did not believe her. And that's because it seemed like she was embellishing when she did not need to. And yeah. that's the other thing. She did not need to do it. There's so much perfor performing going on with both of them in very different yeah. ways. Yeah. And one of the ideas that I noted, I mean, one of the things I noted in watching her was, you know, there's a rhythm to the way people speak and share information. And if you're overwhelmed with earnestness, it becomes overwhelming to the point that it doesn't make any sense anymore. And everything that, you know, as she, like you said, that, that word embellish, as she continued and continued to embellish, and it was so earnest and so earnest, it's like, it, it didn't feel real anymore. You know, no matter how good of actors, both of them are, it, it, you know, that kind of level of earnestness at this level ongoing oh, day after day, it just didn't feel sustainable. I wonder if that's yeah. kind of one of the reasons I had the, yeah. the visceral reaction I did. Well, it's so yeah. interesting to think of, like you're saying, let's put ourselves in her shoes and her perspective of being in a courtroom, which is, you know, they're not a traditional like entertainment audience. And if she's sitting there thinking, oh man, I'm getting nothing back here, which you're not really supposed to in a courtroom, right? Like most people are going to be kind of neutral and stoic and from and the they're jury. And they're wearing masks. They were oh, wearing masks. Yeah, the jury was wearing oh, masks too. That is so fascinating. I, I just had I a student. I did not realize that. I just had yeah. an intern um, that was working with us a couple of years ago do a study looking at how police officers interact with the public with masks on and they did reading of emotions. They did, they used the famous, um, I think it's a test out of Chicago where it just on screen, mm -hmm. you know, looking at yeah. people's emotions with masks. Anyway, I digress, but that, it's just so interesting to think of from her perspective, she feels like she's not getting what she needs in the moment when she's incredibly anxious and nervous and sitting there and she needs some feedback, some soothing. And so she embellishes a little bit more, maybe not even to consciously you know win or get sympathy but because in the moment it just feels off for her and also if we want to talk about if we want to continue with our social psychological talk that we're having she's primed because when she's driving into the courthouse all yep. she sees are justice for johnny right the llamas that were there for johnny depp like all of these things everyone that was there was yep. only for johnny depp the courthouse right the courtroom right in the gallery all of them were for Johnny Depp. So she's walking into a room where everyone is there that's against her. And so she's already primed to say, I have to win these people over. Talking about, you know, some of these diagnoses that she got, the narcissism, borderline, mm -hmm. all that nonsense that she was diagnosed with, right? I think it was, I think it's completely wrong. But if these individuals, right, who grow up in the entertainment industry, who want to have entertainment jobs, understand that in order to get the job, in order to get money, right, in order to live, they have to win these producers over. You walk into a room and everyone's a producer because you don't know who has the real power, right, yeah. Dr. Scott? You, you don't know who the one is really going to be making the decision. So you have to win every single one of them over and you don't know who they are not as a person. So you don't know what kind of person you need to be in order to win them over. So then you have to be all things to everyone all of the time. The people that you really need on your side have a mask over half of their face, right? And the people that you can see are all carrying signs that say justice for Johnny and you know that they're not there for you. So I how think, do you, how can you win? How can you win? I, I think that's a really astute observation. And I like, especially the fact that, you know, what you're doing is pulling away from diagnostic labels, which I think is really wise and, and moral and ethical and frankly better than me because I, I generally tend to get pulled into like, oh, let's slap a diagnosis on it. But one of the things along the lines of that that worked in Depp's favor is that he never wavered in what he was. He presented as his sort of artistic grotesquerie you know, that he's been doing for years yeah. and he was continuous and you may not like it, but at least he's consistent as opposed to what we saw in Amber is this attempt at being a chameleon to every yeah. single question and then, and not, and having difficulty sustaining it. I mean, it felt very 
frustrating for her at some point where she's trying, like you said, to be all things to all people. And no one, no one can sustain that. And nor should they. It may, we might have, the audience might have trusted her more if she was just able to maintain like a sense you know project a sense of stable identity in a way i guess yeah i described it on air when we were talking about the differences between their testimony i said that johnny depp's testimony was naturalistic and authentic amber heard's testimony was rehearsed now i didn't think that either one did something that they shouldn't have done uh, johnny depp absolutely needed to be naturalistic and authentic Amber Heard absolutely needed to be rehearsed. Neither one did the thing that they shouldn't have done, but Johnny Depp was prepared because he was consistent. Mm -hmm. With Amber Heard, she didn't have the consistency that's associated with it. So she may have been rehearsed, but she's still looking for feedback. Johnny Depp didn't care about the feedback because he wasn't the one saying that all of these things impacted his mental illness. So Amber, his mental health, so Amber Heard who used mental health as a part of her uh, defense strategy, now she needs to play into these kinds of things. And now she's got this other expert saying that she's got these other kinds of things. She's got her own expert saying that she's got different things. And who is who can she believe? Who, who can who who is the most, who's the person that she can absolutely rely on as being truthful in what, what they want for her? Johnny yeah. Depp doesn't care because he knows he has all of them. He had a string of individuals go on there, talk about how great he is. Who did Amber Heard have? She didn't have anybody. She had her sister, but everybody's gonna, you know, lower that credibility because it's her sister. Yeah. So it, it was, it's it's such an interesting and kind of voyeuristic look into the into their relationship, into their world that we probably didn't need to get, but now that we, now that it's here and now- Now we, that it's here. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to read, some of the just some things from social media you talked about the the justice for johnny depp hashtag so on tiktok videos tagged justice for johnny depp amassed over 20 billion views while hashtag wow. i stand with amber heard amassed only 30 million um you know content creators just like went to town there was the trend of mocking her testimony from like putting her as dr evil Hashtag Amber Turd was something that was, you know, viral yeah. to the my dog stepped on a bee meme that we couldn't get away from. Um, <laughs> they were doing comedy skits, mocking her legal team's performance. I mean, the ridicule yeah. was just like really, really hard to escape. Um, and then you have Johnny Depp with his odd behaviors that were just sort of written off as like his little quirks, you know? So right. again, we're he was doing allowed this, that. Yeah, yeah, we're doing this double standard thing. Well, every single move of hers was disparaging of you know she's being manipulative or cruel or emotionally unstable right what do we always go yeah. to with women like let's just she's see just her, her wombs just flying all over the room it's it's wandering it's wandering, <laughs> it's wandering. And, wandering and also yeah. like why you know an example of of holding that double standard is you know johnny's um declaration that i will not look you in the eye you know, like it was oh, yeah. like, why, why wouldn't we give that much, at, at least that as much ridicule as we would Amber's behaviors, because it really was just as, yeah, as significant. Yeah, It's just, they were yeah. willing to accept that and in him where we won't accept her behaviors. Yeah. Let me jump Let me, because this could tie back to something that we talked about earlier. Before we had heard that he had he had told her that I will never look at you, she had already gone on the stand and he was already looking down the entire time. So I was on a, a network with a body language expert and the body language expert said that the reason why he wasn't looking up was because he was the real victim in the story in, in this in, in this incident and a real victim never looks their uh, perpetrator in the eye. What? So never? that's why never never looks their oh, perpetrator speaking in, in absolutes the now wow and, i i must and, that must not have come up in any of my textbooks I, so maybe i, I missed I, that i need to go look i believe that was the one time because usually i can keep myself together but i think that was the one time i actually rolled my eyes on air like what when we're in the box like how we yeah. are like this three-headed box and usually there's four of us but when I literally rolled my eyes when I listened to that. And Please so tell me you came... have a screenshot of that somewhere. <laughs> so, so I'm sure it's somewhere. Uh, and, so, and so then they came to me and said, well, Dr. Del Torre, what do you think? And I, I think 
what I said was that what I think happened was Johnny Depp has a tendency of making all of his, like all of his emotions come out on his face. He makes all kinds of weird faces when like he's upset or he thinks something's wrong. So I think his attorneys told him, look, man, you need to look down because if she's telling a story and she, you start yourself. making faces, like the jury's going to see this and you need to, you need to knock that stuff off. I had not and, even considered that. Sure. Wow. And, and so I, I, what I said on air was that I think what's happening is they told him to not look at her because when she says something, you're going to make a face and you don't want the jury turning because you've already what at that point he had already, they were playing from Amber Heard's team was playing from so far behind. They were never going to catch up. And so don't do anything to lose it. So if he started making faces, then he's more likely to lose the jury. And then later on, we start hearing this nonsense about how, well, I'll never look you in the eye again and stuff like that. Well, they clearly looked at her and stuff like mm -hmm. during breaks, like he clearly did this. I think what really happened was they told him to stop, you know, don't look at her, don't make faces, right? She's going to say what she's going to say, let her do it and just move yeah. on. But this, but this body language expert said that a victim never looks at their perpetrator in the eye. And it's clear then that because he was looking down, he was the victim in this case. I'm sorry. Victims go back to their perpetrators a yeah. lot. Like, yeah. come on. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, actually not even worth a rebuttal there, I yeah. guess. <laughs> it's, I just, uh, it was, it was ridiculous. No, great example. Thank you yeah. for that. Scott, are there any questions from anyone on the feed over at YouTube? I'm not seeing any questions. I mean, we've got a lot of activity. Let me tell okay. you, like this is, this is, and also another, we've got some really smart listeners who I are, know. are making really great comments. Yeah, we have and on it's, Instagram. It's nice to know that people are, are, have feelings about this both ways, but can look at it somewhat dispassionately because i think that that's what we're getting mainly from what you're what dr john is sharing with us today yeah. is that you have to look at the big picture and and um it's a lot more complex than social media wants us to have it we want it we want it to to be just as money making as a TikToker, i guess for sure yeah. i i have one from on instagram um hobosaurus rex love that name um, isn't it also that she didn't fit the desired picture of victim, not because she was attractive, but because her embellishment and her bad behavior undermined the simple image that advocates promote. So I think we touched on this, but, you know, I think that's also sort of a, a forward trend in true crime is like, look, we don't have to say that everybody lit up the room or was perfect, especially when they're victims. Um, they could be dirt bags and have their own baggage in their background and they're still victims and still deserving yeah. of respect yeah. and justice. So that's yeah. a really good point there. Um, okay. If there's nothing else over there, Scott, I think I, you're right. I think yes, one, we have a very smart audience, but I think we did our job today in keeping this like a very, um, informative conversation, not going down some of the junk rabbit holes that we could have <laughs> with with talking about yeah. this this trial and um sitting in the gray isn't always easy and yes i if anything just a reminder about all the different types of bias that are out there that we bring to the table when we're watching things making assumptions listening to content or watching content um so i'm so glad that john you're doing what you're doing because you help paint a better picture for folks to kind of come back to the middle and be mindful of all these things when it's so easy to just throw out our opinions based on one little snippet that we see. Yeah, sure. they're really lucky to have you as a talking head. Like you're the real deal. And it makes it makes me feel better knowing that there are professionals like yourself out there with a real compass and a real grounded view on this whole process. So thank you for doing that. Well, thanks. It's a very nice thing to hear. Thank <laughs> well, <much. laughs> thanks for joining us again. We appreciate it. Yeah. We we figure, you know, it probably won't be the last time. Is he our first returning guest, Scott? Yes. Oh my Am gosh. I? We have to send oh, you some yes. swag for being the first returning. <laughs> I mean, That's great. for awesome. like a few years of doing this, I think you are yeah. first returning guest. So that's, that's awesome. Uh, it is awesome. Yeah. Um, well, we will there's endless things to talk about. So I'm sure we'll figure out something else maybe for 2023. For sure. Um, 
and we're going to be in Dallas. That's so far from San Antonio. I wish you could scoot over and see us next weekend. <laughs> uh, I wish I could, but unfortunately I am in class. So oh, I, the whole master's <laughs> yeah, degree I have, thing. I, I still have, I still have that to do. So unfortunately next time we'll, we'll next find time. We'll find the time for some true crime because I, I may have something on the back burner in the works. I, I may, I may have something. We'll see. Okay. Oh, great. Yay. Yay. Excited. All right, everyone. Thanks for joining us. As always, we appreciate it. It looks like we went unscathed here today with our live stream and um, we will have Dr. Joni back. We promise she has already, we're, we're already figuring out dates with her, um, but thank you everyone. And we'll see you next time on behind the couch. Bye.